Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, all across the planet, on six continents, wherever you may be. This is Kerry Ilanumi with another NoSpendNewsSource.com Productions monthly report. Today is August 14th, 2012, and boy, do we have an explosive show for you today. All right, first of all, with announcements, we have congressional candidate out of Detroit, Bill Roberts, winning the primaries for United States House of Representatives. That's right, so we're seeing a trend, step by step, good folks are stepping to the plate, and guess what, we're seeing victories, even on a federal note, such as Keisha Rogers in the 22nd District of Texas, where NASA is at, as she won the primaries, as she was on our monthly report for May, if you recall, and what would be Bill Roberts now, uh, as of the last two weeks. So good job, Bill, in Detroit, and people in the Detroit area watching the show, you need to support Bill Roberts, he is in the interest of the people. So we have all kinds of things to discuss, including the fact that, uh, well, after organizing and working so hard and trying to do this and that with the politicians that are there, trying to organize and get other people to run for government that just aren't willing to do it and this, that, and the other, I'm finding myself once again pressed into the corner and forced to step to the plate and run for office once again. And we'll be discussing that more later in the show. Uh, I discussed this at the Arlington City Council uh, meeting here in Washington State last week to discuss my candidacy and the current predicament regarding the economy and what's happening in the world. So, before we get into that more, um, well, I would like to recommend three books to you. These are three books that I like to give to you as a homework assignment to research and to look into. The first one is one that I personally have. It's called uh, Where's the Birth Certificate by Dr. Jerome Corsi. The second book is called It is Dangerous to be Right When the Government is Wrong, and that's by Judge Napolitano. And the third book is by Joel Gilbert, which is called Dreams of My Real Father. So the combination of Dreams of My Real Father and Where's the Real Birth Certificate by Jerome Corsi, those books will tell you a whole lot about the rather questionable and spotty history of our so-called president, Barack Hussein. Obama. Now, on with the news. It's getting hot out there, isn't it? Summertime is here, and not just the heat of August with the sun, but politics are coming in. You heard about uh, what would be Paul Ryan being the VP uh, for Mitt Romney, for his uh, running mate. Well, you know, a lot of people, as they're being chanted and cheered with these phrases, these catchphrases that sound kind of constitutional, sound kind of Tea Party-ish, sound kind of revolutionary, that's being touted and spouted by Paul, Congressman Paul, uh, Ryan, and what would be uh, Mitt Romney for president. But the truth of the matter is, they're riding in on the same artificial wave and whatnot that so-called change you can believe in Barack Obama did four years ago. After eight years of being totally disgusted with George W. Bush, the Republican, neocon, warmonger elements, and we saw what happened was with, with the uh, impending doom of the economy falling apart and whatnot, uh, at the end of what would be the term, second term of George W. Bush, people were so tired and upset. Whoever the Democrat was basically had a guarantee right into office. Whoever the other guy was in office. Uh, that was running against uh, uh, those policies. So any person that was considered as another neocon uh, or another Republican or this or that had an unfair advantage, even if it was Abraham Lincoln, as I mentioned before. Not even Abraham Lincoln could have beat Barack Obama in his first term because Barack Obama seemed to be so different, being the first African American to run, you know, and to get where he did for the presidency uh, and everything. It just seemed uh, so remarkable. And I will admit, I will be the first to acknowledge, while this was not a good black man to vote in office, I will say I'm delighted within the American people, not that they didn't do the research and vote accordingly, but I'm delighted within the fact that they were able to reach deep down inside of their hearts and souls and acknowledge what would be a minority, 
ethnic minority uh, presidential candidate, which was Barack Obama, or the potential of having even a woman president, which would have been Hillary Clinton. The sad thing is, and as I've mentioned before, eventually, I believe I stated this on my first show, as a matter of fact, over a year ago, audio report back in June of 2011, that you can only have the office of the presidency going in two directions for a certain length of time. You can only have Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, trying to put the brakes on and create peace while the Obama administration is doing the same things that Bush and Cheney threatened to do as we're now going into Libya, Syria, Iran, this and that, uh, which were just threats of the Bush administration. We're doing it now under a Democrat Peace Prize uh, individual, which is really interesting. That, that's about the best way to, to do some evil and whatnot deed, is not to be so out there and open like Bush was, weapons of mass destruction. No, we got to do it in the name of peace, love, and harmony, because these people are having their constitutional privileges and rights trampled upon. So we have to go in and give them peace bombs and save them. That's right. So, very exciting. So I mentioned that the Office of the Presidency couldn't go two directions for too long. Hillary Clinton has broke. She's now with the Obama faction. I do not have any support or respect any longer for either of the Clintons. I've been supportive in the past to a point, not that I agree with all their stuff, but uh, at this point now they're the same crap uh, at the bottom of the barrel as Obama, as Bush, as the rest of these people. So Republican, Democrat, whatever, they're all kind of getting washed up into the same category. There's not a whole lot of exceptions out there. Um, well, we have uh, Curiosity landing on Mars. That's very, very exciting, and that's going to be a huge, pivotal element of today's show. As a matter of fact, that's today's main focal point, is on Mars. Is on a manned mission to Mars, science driver economy, and the elements that'll avoid, which is right now heading toward an inevitable thermonuclear World War III with Russia and China, this will create the economic circumstances in which will advance the culture, provide economic stability, support amongst these governments and leaders around the world, and, and uh, a really nice scenario for humankind. But we'll go more into what would be that later. Right now, um, we have a teen hospitalized after playing Xbox for four days straight. We have one teen in China that actually died after playing, I believe, two days straight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Xbox, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Uh, we have country superstar Randy Travis arrested uh, last Tuesday night uh, in Texas after walking butt naked into a convenience store to pick up a pack of cigarettes. Wow, sounds like uh, somebody's picking up bones. Anyway, so, uh, Mark Warsfield, 54, was arrested for not smiling as men cyclist rode the race uh, came through in the Olympics. That's right. Uh, outside of London, uh, there was a man that had suffered from a stroke, and he was unable to smile. But because you're supposed to make it look good because everybody loves London and the Olympics, that uh, he was actually arrested for not smiling because he stood out. Not good. 107 million United States citizens on some form of welfare. That's a new statistic that's out. Up from 97 million merely three years ago when Barack insane Obama stepped up to the plate and ran and became our president. Very interesting. So I have a few people out there, not too many, most of these people are still arguing for Obama. They're delusional, they got psychological issues, they're drugged out, they're something. Uh, most people right now at this point, even my hardcore liberal Democrat friends that are out there, are beginning to distance themselves. If they see it or not, all of a sudden they're being more open to a Republican presidency or they're being more open to things as they're beginning to question, am I going to be homeless in a couple of years? Well, if Barack Obama was such a good president, you wouldn't be questioning that, dear Democrat, or anybody else out there. You guys know I'm not a Democrat, I'm not a Republican. I've supported individual policies and folks on both sides of the line, as I'm a, not a divisive guy. I'm a guy that likes to bring people together in unity. Uh, I'm an independent, and I'm about policy. I'm about the interest of the nation-state and the general welfare clause, which is what's instilled 
in the Constitution of the United States in our preamble. So that's where my loyalty is, to you, the people, not to some big bank on Wall Street or a campaign donor or something else. The NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act. Well, we have a Manhattan federal judge, Catherine B. Forrest, as I discussed before, ruled in May that the indefinite detention provision signed into law on December 31st, 2011 by a U.S. President Barack Obama failed to, quote unquote, as labeled by this judge, pass con constitutional muster, unquote, and ordered a temporary injunction to keep the military from locking up any person over allegation of terrorist ties. Last Monday, however, federal prosecutors representing President Obama and Defense Secretary Leon Panetta filed a claim with the Second District Court of Appeals in hopes of eliminating that ban. So yeah, Obama will pretend that this don't exist. He'll pretend that he's not trying to imprison you forever, but yet when a judge says you can't do this, he challenges it. Why would you challenge this, Mr. Obama, if you weren't going to use it on us? GOP sues to enforce Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder's compliance on Fast and Furious to give up information, as what would be Attorney General Eric Holder is still in contempt of court because he refuses. Can you imagine the Attorney General from the Justice Department refusing to give the Congress subpoenaed documents? Simple as that. Yeah, it's the law. Yeah, you're the Congress. But I'm simply not going to listen. We have a runaway government, folks. We have a government that's became like a great, big, crazy, evil Cujo dog that's blind, just throwing snaps in midair. And if you wander too close to that chain, or if the dog's chain or it gets off the chain, it's coming for you one way or another. This thing is off the charts, off the wall. It's taken down our nation. I'm not against government. We have to have some kind of government, but this government is not in the interest of the people. We've got to go back to the Constitution. We gotta fire these people and vote in new people in office. At approximately 11.30 a.m., what would be Eastern Daylight Time, the White House removed a petition uh, the other day regarding the TSA airport screening procedures from the White House We the People website. They had approximately 22 1,500 of the needed 25,000 signatures in order to actually acquire what would be a message directly from the White House. So what happened was, was, was this. Just days before we acquired the amount of signatures that we need in order to elicit an actual written and verbal response from the White House. That's right. We were just right on the verge. Just a few percentile away of actually acquiring what would be a response. They wouldn't be able to ignore this any longer about TSA and airport screening. So what they do? They, uh, before they had to achieve, uh, before we achieved uh, acquiring a response in the time period, it was cut short for maintenance purposes and has never been uh, placed back up on the website yet. So just in the nick of time, just before we got the amount of signatures, a few days prior, they take this down, this element, to do repairs, and they conveniently never put it back up. See what these people do? They tell you, okay, if you give us 25,000 signatures, I'll personally take the time to answer your question myself. So what do they do? They just remove it before it gets to 25,000 signatures. Once they realize, uh-oh, we're gonna have to deal with this. We're gonna have to, the Democrat party and us, the government's gonna have to actually discuss this. We're actually gonna have to take a side here. Oh, no, 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 they just remove their hands from the situation. Here we go. Department of Homeland Security has ordered a large amount of riot gear to prepare for potential civil unrest and rioting at or around the times of the Republican National Convention, Democratic National Convention, along with the 2013 presidential inauguration. Here we go. Like I said, folks, there's no time to sleep today. It's an exciting show to keep your blood pumping. All right. Rebel forces who have invaded the once sovereign nation of Syria have been brutally committing acts of mass murder, torture, crimes against humanity. Assad, nor uh, Muammar Gaddafi deserve this illegal, inhumane treatment. We have uh, Saifa Islam Gaddafi, the son of uh, former leader 
Colonel Gaddafi seeks to have a trial uh, at, the, at the Hague rather than Libya, but currently being denied by Al-Qaeda rebel forces who have also infiltrated and systematically dismantled this nation as what currently is going on in the process of Syria right now. Democrats draft a drone privacy bill. Obama authorizes uh, secret U.S. support for Syrian rebels, according to Reuters.com. Um, in a CNBC interview, quote, too big to fail, former chairman of City Group, uh, Sandy Whale, said that America should separate the banks and pass the Glass-Steagall Act immediately to accomplish this. So we have folks from too big to fail, folks that were actually individual people who capitulated to systematically dismantling our economic system and Glass-Steagall protection that was placed under Franklin Roosevelt. We have some of the same people that were involved in gutting the system are now all of a sudden getting scared as they see justice being served and they're saying, um, we need Glass-Steagall now. Folks in London are saying, we need Glass-Steagall now. Folks that are part of what would be this oligarchical banking system, this international globalist banking cabal that I refer to as the British Empire, which is at the very top of it. Uh, they have lots of underlings that are high up in power that have money and things and they're, you know, there's a bunch of families that are a part of this, but at the very top it still is the British monarchy. The good old Mary Queen of England, not so Mary, and her dear old husband uh, that wants to reduce the world's population and become a deadly virus if there is such things as reincarnation someday. Look that up. Uh, Google Prince Philip 1988 world's, uh, wants to reduce world's population become a virus. That's all you gotta put in. From there you have all kinds of articles and news links. Not just me telling you, you can learn to tell yourself the truth. Supreme Court Justice Scalia saying that quote, limitations possible for gun control according to Washington Times. Uh, whistleblowers at the NSA, Department of Homeland Security, and countless other agencies claiming that the U.S. government is spying on every single American citizen. So not just people who own controversial websites like this guy right there, oh boy, but it could be and is you two at home. So if you think that I just won't get in politics, I just will avoid the situation, I, I, I just won't piss nobody off, and I, I'll somehow stay out of the way of the beast, the, the, the crazed Cujo, or that runaway bus on the road with no brakes. It's not that easy, folks. The bus is inevitably going to hit you, too. So, what are you going to do? Like I said to a bunch of people on a text message I sent out today, you either stand for something or you fall for anything. Where are you at? Some of us are living the life on TV international fame and exposure, others are watching people on TV that are living that life, wishing they were doing something good and dwindling as they're going to Hades. So, we have a rise in weather extremes, threatens infrastructure, extreme heat wave causing major damage to half, excuse me, to a huge chunk of what would be alfalfa, corn, soy, along with many other fruit and vegetable crops throughout the Midwest of the United States. Michael Moore supporting gun control. Very unconstitutional there, Mr. Moore. Mayor Bloomberg of the New York City calling for cops to go on strike and refuse, literally refuse to protect Americans until we the people give up our Second Amendment rights to bear arms. That's a coup d'etat. When you tell your government to stand down or to do something like this, that's a coup d'etat. That's a takeover of the United States. They're saying until we give up our Constitution and choose to do it willingly, not to support the people. Mayor Bloomberg should be thrown in prison for that statement, along with other things he's done. Ron Paul's audit of the Fed bill passes House in an overwhelming majority. And what's funny is Senator Harry Reid, which has always supposedly been such a big supporter ever since the 80s of what would be editing, or excuse me, what would be uh, checking out the Federal Reserve, that ultimately, uh, to audit, he's now against it conveniently enough. Remember two years ago when he was in that questionable, scary race he almost lost for Senate? Remember the one where he was down 5-6%? And then all of a sudden, a couple days later, he just, he ends up being 5 or 6% above the candidate? Remember those weird, questionable circumstances that happened two years back with the uh, Speaker of the House, or excuse me, with the uh, Senate Majority Harry Reid? I do. 
Anyway, um, well, he's not supportive of it right now. And he's actually saying that he won't even bring it up for a vote. He'll just leave it off. How do you make sure you don't get something voted into office? You just don't let it get voted on to begin with. How do you like that? How do you keep the United States from ever going anywhere good? You put somebody like Mr. LaRouche in prison, or whatever it takes. So he's just not there on the scene to be able to be your president. So whatever you get is uh, shabbier or worse. It's change you can believe in. Maybe it's Barack Obama. Black Bush, right? LIBOR. Well, I mentioned a lot. I talk about the city of London. I talk about a lot of things. But before we go more into that, this is what we're going to do. At this point in the show, we're going to discuss what would be the manned mission to Mars, which will be inevitable if we ever want to get off this rock in one piece uh, and uh, have a successful, happy, healthy future, but also what would be the first stepping stone of this, which is what would be curiosity, landing on Mars successfully against the wishes of the Barack Obama administration and anybody like him, such as the Queen of England. This is a huge fundamental pushing stepping stone for mankind. This is exciting. This has ultimately inspired me and is inspiring lots of people out there in the world. So, before we go further into the show, right now we're going to give you what would be the hour-long segment of the LaRouche Pack weekly report discussing what would be the scientific variables from Leesburg, Virginia. So enjoy this video of LaRouche Pack, and I'll be right back. This past week we had probably the most fantastic development anywhere in the solar system, uh, which is the landing of the uh, Mars Science Laboratory, this uh, uh, pretty large rover that's landed on Mars. It's called Curiosity. It was named by a 12-year-old girl, from what I understand. Um, appropriate name, but this is one of the most magnificent things that's happened in uh, quite a while in our solar system. Now. Um, I'm sure, Lynn, you're going to want to say more about this, but the way to look at this type of phenomenon is not, you know, it's an amazing rover. The observations it's going to make are absolutely fantastic. We have no idea what it's going to find up there. We have some ideas, but we don't know exactly what it's going to find. But the core of its importance resides in the mind of man and what man is, because man is not a being of the senses. Right, we have the you know, physical stuff of our beings, you know, our flesh and so forth. We have senses. We can look around, we can see things, we can feel things and so forth. We can develop new sense uh, perceptions in order to sense more, uh, like uh, scales in order to weigh things or uh, telescopes and things like that. But it's in none of those senses that the true stuff of man resides. Man is outside the senses and use those senses in order to juxtapose them to find what is, what is really happening in the universe. What is generating those senses? What are the processes that we don't see with our senses that are causing those sense perceptions to happen? Now, uh, the lander on Mars, the best way to look at it is that it is a very, it's a miraculous sense organ that we've created. Um, and I'll go through just uh, some of the uh, some of the details of what's actually on this thing. But it's a miraculous sense organ. It's one of several that we right now have uh, exploring our solar system. We have several right around uh, Mars itself. But uh, the study of uh, our space environment by new sense organs that are sent out into uh, the solar system is a relatively recent phenomenon. We started sending objects into space back in the 19... Uh, late 50s, early 60s, and we started landing objects on other planets starting in the 19, uh, actually in the 1960s uh, with the Apollo program, and we started landing robotic probes on other planets in the 70s starting with uh, the Viking landers. Um, but right now we have a growing infrastructure in space of sense apparatus, and specifically around Mars, where we have, uh, we have uh, three satellites right now orbiting Mars. Uh, one is European, it's the Mars Express, uh, which you know, uh, takes very detailed images of the ground. There is the Mars Odyssey orbiter, which is the or oldest one we have orbiting Mars. We have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which uh, showed up at Mars in 2006, 
and is acting right now as a relay to the rovers that are on the ground uh, to communicate to controllers on the Earth. The actual rovers we have on the ground operating are one of the two uh, Mars Exploration Rovers, Opportunity, which is still functioning after uh, uh, almost a decade of operations, and the Mars Curiosity Rover. So these five uh, systems, which are on and around Mars, form an array of sense perceptions at that planet. Um, now just on the actual Curiosity rover itself, um, this is the largest thing we've ever landed on another planet, barring the Apollo program. All right, this thing is as large, it's a two-ton car essentially, it's about as big as a, a Volkswagen Beetle. It's very large, very maneuverable. Um, if you look at it, the, uh, the way the wheels are set up are exactly the same as all the prior Mars rovers. Uh, but it's very large, and it has a huge array of instruments. Um, they're calling it the Mars Science Laboratory because it's, it has a full, uh, almost like a full laboratory setup of the chemist and a full laboratory setup for the geologist on board, including all of the uh, gear it needs to drill samples out of the rock, dump it into the little laboratory containers, and do the experiments. It's a fully operational, roving, automated laboratory. And just some of the things that it has are, it's got a variety of cameras. It has like a head, it's called the mast. And on the mast are these two cameras, which give stereo vision at about the height of an actual human being. Um, very, uh, you know, very high resolution cameras. On the mast is another thing called the chem cam, which uh, it has, a, it's pretty cool. It can shoot a laser uh, about uh, seven meters, hit a rock, vaporize a little square millimeter of the rock, and then another camera will look at the gas that's emitted from that rock and analyze the spectral composition of the material of the rock. So if there are things that the rover can't get to, it can blast a little uh, you know, smoke cloud out of the rock and see what the rock is made of. Uh, when the, uh, it has several uh, other things. When the rover can get up to an actual rock, uh, it has an object called the, uh, the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer, which you put against the rock, it shoots alpha particles at the rock and gets it to emit X-rays, which can give you a very detailed chemical composition of that rock, which is very important. Uh, on Mars, because you can't just determine the type of a rock by looking at it. You have to uh, do an x-ray analysis, which is the most detailed way to get elemental composition. Um, it has a, the ability, like I said, to drill out, uh, you know, essentially file off part of the rock, and then put it into two different types of containers, which can do uh, scientific experiments. One of them uh, has the ability to vaporize the rock inside this container, do a chemical analysis, a mineral analysis, and an analysis of organics to see if there are the organic molecules necessary for life uh, in the sample. Um, another one just does pure uh, mineral analysis to find out what the composition of the, uh, what the crystal structure is of the rocks and what the rocks are made of. Um, there's also two experiments. Well, there's also a the little meteorology thing where you can get uh, wind speed, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, things like that. You can tell whether it's raining there, whether it rains, which is not uh, a moot point. It might actually rain. I'm going to talk about what the where this thing actually landed. It's possible that it actually does rain <coughs> within this crater. Um, so there's a little meteorology lab. But some of those interesting things, uh, uh, we can talk about it in a bit, are related to future manned missions to Mars. One of the most important experiments they have on this thing is called the uh, radiation assessment detector, which is designed to measure all the types of radiation that would be dangerous to human beings on the surface of Mars. Uh, whether the radiation is coming from the ground, whether the radiation is coming from the sun, whether the radiation is coming from the galaxy at large. This thing can measure uh, the rates of radiation to see if what types of shielding people would need when we eventually go to this other planet. So anyhow, this thing is a fantastic uh, set of instruments which can move around 
on the surface and gather samples and do a very detailed analysis. Now, uh, the place that it landed is, you know, this is a miraculous object. The place that it landed is one of the most miraculous places on Mars. And uh, it's one of four spots that were investigated. But Gale Crater is absolutely awesome. Actually, I got, this is where the imagery comes up here. Uh, if you look at a map of Mars done by one of the, uh, I think this is the Mars, uh, Mars Odyssey, I'm not sure which one, but it's a topographical map of Mars where blue is, uh, it's elevation. Blue is very low relative to the average height of landforms on Mars. Orange and red is very high. White is really, really high. So you can see the northern hemisphere is very low elevation. They call it the northern lowlands. The southern hemisphere of Mars is very high, and they call it the southern highlands. Um, and one interesting discrepancy that they found is that the southern highlands are actually very, very cratered, so they call it the southern crater highlands, where the northern hemisphere is very, very smooth. There are very few craters, and those craters that exist are very young craters. Um, so there's this dichotomy. The northern hemisphere is very low, the, northern, the southern hemisphere is very high, and the southern hemisphere is very rough, the northern hemisphere is very uh, smooth. Some people think that the northern hemisphere used to be covered by an ocean, which is why there's no very few craters there. The ocean wiped out a lot of the, uh, a lot of the early uh, evidence of bombardment. And there's some other features. There's the Tharsis area, which is very, is a very heavily uplifted volcano. It's Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system is there. Uh, and then the largest crater is on, in the southern hemisphere, Hellas Basin. Huge crater. Now, Gale Crater, which is where the uh, Curiosity rover landed, is right at the boundary of this dichotomy of heights. It's right about here. i got to zoom in on it. Now here you can see Gale Crater. You can see it's right on the boundary. North of Gale Crater is very, very low elevation. Uh, south of Gale Crater is very, very high elevation. Now for, um, in the satellite analysis that we have of this crater, it looks like, first of all, it's very old. It's a very, very old crater. It goes back probably four billion years, back to the time when they think there was still running water on Mars. There's evidence that the crater itself, after it was made, was covered over and buried for a long period of time, so there was no evidence of the crater actually on the ground. And over that buried crater flowed rivers of liquid water. And then after time, the water apparently dried up. There is uh, one of the hypotheses is that uh, the existence of running vast amounts of liquid water disappeared early on in the history of Mars. Um, after that happened, they think that the crater was then excavated by winds from Mars. That over you know billions of years the crater just got excavated. All the looser sediments which were laid down by the water were uh, carried away, leaving first of all digging it very very deep. It's one of the deepest places on Mars. It goes down about four kilometers in depth, and it left a central peak which is called uh, Aeolus Mons. They call it the uh, the easier name is Mount Sharp, but uh, it's a five kilometer tall kind of uh, mountain inside this crater, which is a mountain made of the sediments that had been laid down that weren't carried away by whatever the winds were that excavated the crater. The plan for Curiosity is to travel up a good distance on that mountain because that mountain is going to preserve sedimentary layers which represent the history of Mars. The way you know the history of a planet is uh, you know, if it's a planet that doesn't have obvious signs of life, you know the history in pretty much two ways. One is uh, looking at the craters, counting craters. But the other way, uh, which we've not been able to do on any other planet, is by looking at the layers of sediment. Because that tells you what's happened. Uh, by looking at sedimentary layers, you can get what the composition of the atmosphere was at various times in the history of the planet. Uh, you can tell if there was water. You can tell if there was no water. You can find organic uh, material which represents the existence of life, if there was life at a certain point. 
all of the fossils we find on the Earth are in sedimentary layers, sediment that was laid down by water. So if there is fossils on Mars, we'd probably find them in this thing that the Mars Curiosity rover is going to go uh, travel up. So the point is that this is an awesome place for uh, geological and chemi chemical analysis of the planet, and it would it'll act as what they hope a Rosetta Stone for the history of the entire planet. Now, for our purposes, why we think it's awesome is uh, it's in the it's in it's in the sense of uh, planetary defense. And I know Ben, you're going to go through the uh, some of the aspects of uh, specifically the asteroid defense. But as we laid out in the uh, planetary defense report, understanding uh, the defense of man within a solar system requires a detailed knowledge of what the history of the solar system is so that we can understand what are the great threats that will face our, you know, face man. What were the threats that uh, wiped out creatures in the past? Because there are very clear extinction events on Earth which appear to have a periodicity where the period is so long that we can't find any process, any domestic local process on the Earth that can cause these large time spans between extinction events. We expect that they're, uh, at the very least, solar events, but more likely galactic, uh, galactic scale processes. Now, the problem that we face so far is that the investigation of uh, the record of the Earth, or the solar system, is confined to the Earth. You know, we've studied all the sediments of the Earth, and we have the data from the Earth, you know, a lot of detail from the Earth. But we need to go out and study the rest of the planets, because they're all records of changes of the solar system as a whole. We do need to locate which processes are invariant relative to what planet you're on, versus which processes are specific to the planet, in order to begin to unravel what are the larger processes that we need to be aware of for for defense, but what defense really means is the sustained survival and propagation and increased power of man uh, through the solar system and the rest of the galaxy. So that's what this represents. This is a uh, this represents a first step towards understanding that larger history, which is most likely a galactic scale history. Um, and so that's the domain of man. So you can say some things about. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I think it's useful to, it's good you brought up the history of life question, because I think it's useful to give a, uh, you compare mankind to life, to other forms of animal life, simply animal life, and you know, what we have in the record is a very clear record, like you said, that any simply animal species, it does not have a, you know, forever existence on this planet. We have a whole record of species that's gone, one after the other, and there's, you know, we've discussed this in detail. So it's, the, the point is, if we step back and, then, and look from this standpoint, and look then at the human species and really ask the question, from this standpoint, from this uh, cosmic galactic perspective, what will, what, will really, what will it really take to ensure that mankind continues to exist you know, on this planet in the solar system? And I think what's uh, useful to step back and also draw out, which you, you know, opened with on the curiosity and the... Uh, the different sense perceptual systems we're building around Mars is really emphasizing this question that mankind, what makes mankind mankind, and not just another animal species, is that we're not biologically determined. This this is a, this typifies the expression that mankind is not a biological species. We have a biology, but what defines us is not the biology. What defines us is typified by what NASA just did and successfully landing this instrument on Mars. And uh, <clears throat> the point is that that has to be the self-conscious conception of mankind if we're going to deal with these threats. And, you know, I wanted to then, then use this to then discuss this question of the asteroid defense of the planetary defense, because the point is, from what we already know, just from the history of life, from the, I mean, every, every one of these craters, right, where do these craters come from? Right? This is dramatic evidence that you don't have just uh, pristine, unchanging conditions in the solar system. You have uh, intense effects, collisions, uh, uh, impacts from objects from the, from the solar system. So the point is, what we just can know in principle is that if mankind is going to continue to exist for a prolonged period, 
we're going to have to not only expand the power of the mind of man in being able to see and have this extended sense, sensory capability, but we're going to have to change the solar system. That's the asteroid defense issue. We're going to have to change the solar system. Because we know that these uh, asteroids, comets, they are going to impact at a certain point. You know, they're going to hit the Earth at a certain point. You can debate when and what the different threats are and stuff. But we know that it, to guarantee the continued existence of mankind means mankind has to become a creature that not only has a sensory capability to, to, to sense and understand the solar system, but to change it, to change the orbits of these different bodies. And so I just wanted to, two things I just wanted to go through and present in that aspect to kind of uh, highlight what we're looking at. Um, which is that, first of all, before we do that, first of all, the point is, you have, uh, in this planetary defense question, you have a scale of objects you're dealing with. Let me take two examples. Take one example, uh, you have an impact crater, which they've dated to around 65 million years ago. And it's even a little hard to really get across the scale and the power of these things. But this was a 10-kilometer object that hit the Earth at somewhere in the range of 20,000 miles per hour. So to, to, to the speeds are just incredible. The energy release is incredible. And you're talking about this thing is moving so fast that when it hits the Earth, going from 20,000 miles per hour to zero in, you know, a few miles time scale, heats the whole thing up that just literally explodes and it has global planetary effects. Um, and this, this object at the time, I mean, it created tsunamis that covered entire continents, uh, uh, ash clouds that then engulfed the entire Earth. I mean, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of time to get your mind around the scale of these things. These, these things do happen. These larger ones, it's good to know that they're much less frequent. But much less frequent. Like with this scale, you know, I mean, it's worth, it's worth really thinking about what actually has happened and will happen again very likely at some point. But then recognize that on these, the, the frequency of getting hit with objects in the range of 5 to 10 kilometers is not very often. It's every 50 million years, 100 million years is what the records NASA uh, estimates the current records. I'll get into that a little bit. But that, that's on one extreme, see, these very large objects. But then that goes all the way down to very small objects, which can still have very dramatic effects. And one thing that, one case example that's useful to illustrate uh, this other end of the scale, the other extreme, is the case of the, uh, what's called the Tunguska event in Siberia in 1908. So in 1908, there was a massive explosion in the sky in Siberia. It was a very unpopulated area, so there's a lot of, there's some difficulty figuring out exactly what happened. But the most agreed upon idea is that this is probably an um, asteroid somewhere in the range of 30 to 50 meters in diameter. So much, you know, 10 kilometers, that's like the size of Mount Everest, right? You know, now we're talking about the size of like a, I don't know, like a bus or a whale or something, some dramatically smaller object. But this thing still came in, it still came in at, again, you know, you're talking about 20, 30,000 miles per hour, dramatic speeds. Um, what they think it did is it, they think it exploded in the atmosphere because it heated up because it was being slowed down by the atmosphere. It heated up so quickly it then exploded and then sent a blast wave down and uh, leveled an area of somewhere in the range of 800 square miles. Now, just to put this in perspective, if you compare... Uh, what if this were to happen, say, over Washington, D.C.? This completely encircles Washington, D.C. and goes right into the immediate surrounding area. Or you could do a similar, you know, put it over Los Angeles. You know, it covers nearly the entire greater Los Angeles area. Um, similar with New York, the Bay Area. Now, granted, the chances of getting a direct hit on a major metropolitan area are probably very, very small. But th this is the smaller end of the types of objects that we know uh, are out there and have impacted and do impact frequently. And they can cause, as you can see here, it could cause potentially very dramatic, I mean, this would level cities. This would level an entire metropolitan area. So they can cause pot potentially very dramatic uh, local or regional scale um, effects. So just to give us the two extremes, right? You have extremely large extreme, uh, and smaller events. Now this is... Uh, 
this chart here represents some of the analysis by NASA, by JPL. They've been studying this uh, subject in depth. Certain people have do a lot of work on this. And so you see a, a clear, they, they've calculated, estimated a pretty clear relationship between the size of the object and how frequent they expect that size object to impact. So again, you have these two objects I discussed as examples on here. Tunguska marked kind of in the middle upper left here. Um, the lower, lower right is the, um, the first one I discussed, the 10 kilometer object. Uh, as you can see uh, on the bottom scale, you have the, on the uh, bottom scale you see the energy released in TNT equivalents. You get a scale of the energy released from these uh, impacts. And then on the top, that's correlated directly with the size of the objects. So on the far left, you have a four, four meter across object. And then the biggest you get is like a nine kilometer object. So again, you just look at the scale, the range of the different sizes that we know are out there we have to deal with. Um, and then the uh, horizontal axis then looks at the frequency. So like I said, when you get to the size of, say, an eight-kilometer object, a huge, I mean, again, this is the size of Mount Everest. I mean, Mount Everest is about nine kilometers high. So, so imagine Mount Everest falling from the sky. You know, it's a pretty uh, remarkable thing to get your mind around. But that's something of that scale they think happens maybe once every hundred million years. But then you go to, say, Tunguska size events, objects of maybe... Um, 30 to 50 meters that can have dramatic, you know, local effects. Those happen, say, once every 200 years or so. So it's much more frequent. Um, you get smaller, they come, become even more frequent. I saw there was a presentation by a NASA official discussing that uh, uh, the Air Force has satellites where they monitor the entire atmosphere. Because if some nation's launching a missile, they want to know that nation's launching a missile. So they, you know, monitor all this stuff. What they pick up are a lot of uh, uh, meteorites and asteroids coming in the atmosphere. And uh, they'll get objects that are smaller, say like 10 meters or so. When that comes in the atmosphere, they usually, these even smaller ones, they, they tend to uh, burn up much higher. They don't necessarily have an effect that propagates all the way down. But they can still, say a 10 meter object roughly, can still release the amount of energy up similar to, to the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. So you're talking about a small nuclear weapon uh, exploding in the upper atmosphere. And sometimes people hear them or feel them. You get news reports every now and then of people hear an explosion, table shaking, different type of stuff. It happens every now and then. Uh, the amount of this size, you know, a small nuclear weapon, not necessarily as big as Tunguska, but the equivalent of a small nuclear weapon exploding in the upper atmosphere from asteroids coming in, this happens about 30 times a year. So this is not like an un seen event. I mean, this is, this is like daily, this is what it means to live on Earth. This is just part of living in the solar system. Right. So the point is to kind of just to get, begin to set up a scale of the type of stuff we're dealing with uh, and put things in perspective. Um, now, the point I'd like to get to is that we have been making, because of the dedicated effort of a few people, um, We've pushed to get a dedicated observation system. So NASA, uh, JPL has a center where they're focused on tracking as many of these things as they can. They have automated telescopes that just scan the entire sky repeatedly. And they automatically then record everything they see, compare it with the existing database, and see if there's anything new. Anything new, then it identifies, it isolates it, and it tries to find its orbit, and tries to approximate its orbit. So we have, like, fully automated uh, systems now that are... You know, we need a lot more, but they're beginning to develop these things that'll scan the entire sky and begin to track thousands and thousands of these objects, right? So, but the point is, uh, what uh, if we were to see an object that was going to hit the Earth, these observation systems are absolutely crucial because to have any type of serious effort to uh, stop it from intersecting the Earth, uh, you want to intersect it 10 years before its expected impact. You know, with, with these systems, they'll extrapolate 100 years into the future. You know, there's, there's degrees of error. You know, it's, they're not sure exactly where it's going to be 100 years from now, but they try and get forecasts in the range of 50, 60, 100 years in the future. 
the point is that if we see an object that's going to hit the Earth, we want to be able to intersect it at least on the range of 10 years before it would hit us, right? Um, which means we need to prepare a mission 5, 7, 10 years before that, because you've got to design it, you've got to build it. I mean, right now we have no dedicated plan for what the plan of action would be. There's different proposals, nothing's been tested, nothing's been demonstrated. So you need at least something on the range of 20 years, 15, 20 years of advanced warning if you're really going to defend the Earth from an object that you think is likely going to hit us. But then the point is, to get to the point, when you, when you start to look at those time scales, you don't know, you might see an object where you think in 25 years there's a 1 in 30% chance it will hit us, or 1 in 30 chance it will hit us. Um, you might see another object that's a 1 in 50 chance it will hit us, right? Remember this estimation for Tunguska size objects. That's about 1 in 200 years, right? But if you're looking at objects that have, uh, where you're not able to determine precisely enough if it's, if, if where exactly it's going to be in 20 years, we're going to be faced with a situation as we continue to track more and more of these objects. For every one uh, Tunguska size event that might hit us, uh, we might see 50 potential impacts. We might see 50 objects that each have a 1 in 30, 1 in 70, 1 in 100 percent chance, 1, 1 in 100 chance of hitting the Earth. Now, if you waited for each of those to play through, by the time you know 100 percent if it's going to hit or not, it's too late. So the point is, we're, 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 we're right now kind of on the cusp of the point in which this question is going to start to come up for governments. We're going to start to get every potentially every few years, uh, a new case of 100 meter size object, uh, 1 in 75 chance it's going to hit in 15 years, do we act now? Maybe a couple years later you get another object, you know, 90 meters across. You know, if that came in, it could, it could uh, have damage the size of a medium sized country. You know, very significant regional, uh, uh, and maybe, maybe there's a you know, 1 in uh, 120 chance that'll hit in 25 years, do we act, right? So the point is, as we continue to observe more and more and track more and more of these bodies, especially the smaller ones, we've seen a lot of the bigger ones, we have a better sense of where a lot of the bigger ones are, but a lot of the smaller ones we are beginning now to more and more track. And, uh, you know, the estimates of the officials, you know, experts working in this field, is that we're getting to the point where this question is going to start to come up in a very serious way. And it's going to come up to governments saying, we know... Uh, do we act? There's this chance uh, for this event, there's this chance for this other event, do we act? Do we act? So the point is this, this, we're kind of on the cusp with our growing sensory capability of really needing to address this question in a very serious way. So that's, that's I think, one thing that's worth really putting on the table in this context. Um, the other point just to make is that there's also a, a 2007 study that's worth noting where they, um, this was done by uh, a grouping of the University of Southampton. Uh, they did a study looking at simulating thousands of random impacts all over the planet and just said basically just let the simulation run. You know, if there were like thousands of impacts, what would the effect be of each impact? And they looked at which nations were, the, were then affected the most. And the nations that had the highest uh, death counts were largely in Asia. Because one of the big dangers is these things impacting the ocean and you generating a massive tsunami. Now imagine, remember what happened in Indonesia, was that 2004 I think, I mean there's hundreds of thousands of people, it's hard to get your mind around that scale of uh, that event was incredibly dramatic. Uh, these can have the same effect if they hit in the ocean. Um, the United States is also very vulnerable because we have two coasts and we're also very populated on both sides of those coasts. So we're vulnerable on the uh, impacts into the Atlantic and into the Pacific. Um, so t on the top of the list, in terms of both life lost and economic impact, China is number one and U.S. is number two in terms of nations vulnerable to... Uh, they're also simulating smaller scale impacts like we're discussing here. So it's worth putting on the table is that these, are two, these two nations are right now the most vulnerable if... In, in the event of these small, medium-scale impacts. We're right now sitting on the top of the list. Um, but all this just to make the point, and to tie it back to the point, the, the, the victory 
of the Mars landing is that this is, again, step back, this, this is the question for mankind as a whole. Are we going to actually recognize our destiny as a non-biological species? Because like I said, what we know from the history of life is that any single species, there's no guarantee it's going to continue to exist for any indefinite period of time. What we know is that if we're going to ensure that mankind continues to exist, not only are we going to have to expand the powers of mind to observe and uh, sense the entire solar system and begin to sense the galaxy in our galactic environment, but as discussed in this case as one example, we're going to have to change it. We're going to have to change Mankind, if it's going to continue to exist, you know, it might not be to a great degree. We might, you might change a couple asteroids a very small amount to start. You know, we're talking about a few kilometers second change is all you need if you're dealing, you know, 20 years into the future. But that's mankind changing the solar system. And that, that's what we're looking at as, as that's what the Mars victory represents, the NASA victory on Mars, um, in the face of fascists like Obama who hate science and want to depopulate the planet and reduce our scientific capability. Um, this is what the future has to be for you know, our nation and international relations if we're actually going to take this uh, future of humanity seriously. So that's why I put that on the table. Yeah, there's one thing which is it goes in a somewhat different direction but is relevant to the same business. And I would like to emphasize that. I would thought this would be for, more important to, at this time to have this presented. Mm -hmm. And then we can go back and treat some, some of the other things. I'll just indicate one of them, which is extremely important. Uh, mankind. Well, we look at the biological history of man on the planet. And we find we have a phenomenon called man, which is unique, which has what we call noetic characteristics. And no other known species has those characteristics. Now we're dealing with this Mars development we're actually getting into the nature of the universe because therefore the question is where does uh, noetic intelligence come into play in terms of the planets, the planetary system, and in terms of particularly of life? Is it possible since the this universe is organized as a universe that the, the noetic capabilities we associate with human the human mind could not have been generated on Earth by itself. Mm. Not possible. Because this is absolutely qualitative. Mm. And there's very little attention paid to this. And when you talk about the uh, survival of human beings, you have to look at the survival of Earth. Now, does, does Earth does the Earth have a survival potential for human beings? Maybe not. But get, does that mean that a superior uh, characteristic of action, which is human and intellect, most people don't know what a human intellect is because they don't cultivate one. But the human, the human mind, the creative powers of the human mind are unique, and they are belong on the scale of, shall we say, evolution. In other words, if you look at the human, the human life in terms of the biological origins of human life, you have a phenomenon which occurs which is unique, and you cannot derive this from something below. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it exists. It exists in the system. And therefore, the assumption is then that the quality of creativity or human creativity exists in the universe. It's not just something which has occurred on Earth because it's a higher order of things. It's not simply a higher degree of evolution of biological systems, but it's an, it has an actually noetic characteristic which exists, which is the most efficient mechanism we know of. It's known to exist on Earth, to the human population. It's known to have a history of existing on Earth also, which we know. And it's a very recent history in terms of the history of the planet. So the, the question then comes back to another question. Well, if this potential, this quality, exists not only on Earth in this rare species called man, huh? what about the universe? Is that because this is a power which is greater than anything we know. That is, human noetic powers are more, uh, 
more effective force in, in history than anything else. And can you say that this, uh, that we, we can exterminate human beings, is that going to shut off the universe? Shut off something in the universe? Or not? And therefore we have to look at these things in the, this way. And this is one of our, really one of our challenges. And it, it goes against the idea that uh, human intelligence is what most people think it is. It actually is a, it's a force in the universe which we have no duplicate of in terms of our knowledge. But we do have a, a, the, the knowledge of the evolution of man as a man becoming man with this noetic capability. So we have to say, in a sense, the noetic capability of man was generated also on Earth. But it's a, it's a universal principle. And this, uh, this is what we really have to think about, because we don't really presently understand man himself in these terms. We understand the phenomenon, we react to it, but there are very few people, even living people and scientists and so forth on this planet, who take this into account. They, they will admit that the noetic faction exists, but they do not try to understand it. And obviously, what this implies, the existence of this implies that the whole system, the whole universal system, or our galaxy and so forth, is permeated by this principle. Because it evolved, to our knowledge, it evolved on Earth. It's, but it's a characteristic which intrinsically cannot, it has not been generated in any other ways except, except from life. The evolution of life which goes through a qualitative change. And welcome back to the monthly report show. Well, as you can see by that very informative one hour long video there, it's not just about traveling around in space and having some new place to vacation. It's a imperative for the survival of mankind. It's inevitable, simply put. So we don't have the luxury and option just to stick around here on Earth forever and wait for something to happen. The dinosaurs did that, and look where they went. So unless we want to go the way of the dinosaurs, if we want to go out, explore, be fruitful, multiply, and explore the cosmos, and to get out there and to be able to survive, we are going to have to master the laws of the universe. We're going to have to figure out a whole bunch of things. And we're on the verge of it, as Mr. LaRouche discussed. Once we create a moon base and we create certain what would be uh, thermonuclear propulsion systems, which could be done in a generation, we could then be launching manned mission to Mars and having uh, that happening from the moon and we could be getting to what would be Mars from the moon in anywhere from seven to ten days. That's remarkable. Very remarkable. And how exciting is that? For Because right now, I mean, we've been into space. We have people in space, in the International Space Station and this and that, but we don't have humans living in space. We've never lived in space. How amazing and beautiful would it be and inspiring to know that we are about to accomplish and actually follow through with what would be having a permanent colony on the moon and then onto another planet as well. Now that all of a sudden makes tomorrow a very optimistic image. What's happening right now? We're all looking back to the good old days. Why? Because where this economy and things are heading yesterday and today inevitably is going to be way better than tomorrow. The next day is going to be more worse. Next year is going to be horrible. Is that the future we want to have in the back of our minds? 2012! The world's going to end! A lot of people think that. A lot of people are ready to put the gun to their head, the rope around their neck, and just toss in the towel right now. A lot of people. I'm seeing all kinds of road rage and action and people doing weird, crazy things. Husbands and wives that were so close that are all of a sudden... And you wonder, where did that come from? People that were never even ran a stop sign are out there robbing a bank, raping someone, doing something crazy. And you wonder, what, what just happened? What, what's going on? You hear about these crazy cannibals 
eating bath salts and going off on people, you know, for a late night snack. I mean, or midday snack is the one in Florida. I mean, you, you, you got to wonder what's going on in the world, folks. I know I do. You know, people wonder about me. They ask me, Carrie, how can you do what you do with this news show and whatnot? How could you fight the New World Order? How could you do this? And on my end, I'm looking back saying, how could you not? What is your problem? Why aren't you doing something in the world to make this a better place? And we've got, you know, folks out there that say, thank God for Carrie Olanumi. Thank God for Alex Jones. Thank God for Lyndon LaRouche. Thank God for Jesse Ventura. Thank God for this, that, and the other. But most of these people aren't doing a damn thing. They're not sending any campaign contributions. They're not buying something from the store to help support these operations. Most of us are lone ducks. Most of us get supported when it's convenient or when it gets to the point to where you have no other option and you have to have our support and politics become in is what's happening across the globe right now. As politics are coming in uh, and becoming more popular as people are starving and being oppressed, well, folks like me only gain momentum and credibility. I hate being right, because it's not good for anybody. But you look at my track record forecasting economics and politics in general, and it's spotless, folks. So I want to talk about LIBOR real quick. I contacted Congressman Rick Larson here in the 2nd District as well, our Congressman, which I've discussed before, as he's had me come in and advise his office of several factors back at the end of June. What will he actually do now? Only God knows. Anyway, uh, the LIBOR scandal could turn ugly as U.S. cities begin to sue is your Google headline for the Huffington Post article. Let me read that to you one more time. LIBOR, L-I-B-O-R, that's how you spell it. Scandal could turn ugly as U.S. cities begin to sue. Well, what is the LIBOR? It's the London Interbank Offer Rate. That's right. What does L stand for? Say it with me. London. What does Kerry say is the only enemy of the people of the United States and the world at B? The British Empire. That's right. You just said it. Or you thought of it because you know what I would have said. British Empire. The city of London. Now here we go. This here is a little bit more evidence and proof for you that the city of London and that sweet little thing the Queen perhaps is more closer to sour and being rather rotten than she is on the side of being so soft and so sweet with her nice little accent. Ultimately, 75% of all cities in the United States, a whole bunch of states, and it goes a lot further to not just government and the people and mortgages and payrolls and this, it goes on and on and on, are connected to something called the LIBOR. Luckily here in Washington State, it's illegal to be connected to this. We have our own problems, but it's not LIBOR. Uh, we have plenty of our own. But anyway, ultimately, most cities and states throughout the city, including what would be San Jose, California, has signed on to something called the LIBOR. They've been swindled. The money that we've been paying out towards so-called debts that we don't even owe to begin with, well, guess what? The interest rate of the debt that we don't owe to begin with has also been played. That's right. The robber isn't just happy coming in your home once. This guy... Every time you get a paycheck and you begin to get a new TV or anything else, he just comes back again and gets that too. Oh, you got some new shoes? See you over the weekend. Anyway, so cities are suing the living hell out of LIBOR. I don't blame them regarding this. Um, because they're discovering that even under the economic crunch that they're under, inevitably, without Glass-Steagall and the National Bank on the books, Procura Commission and whatnot coming into play to take care of stuff, there's obviously no anecdote in sight. So they're suing and getting what they can. And they're even stating, like San Jose, they're saying, you know, we wouldn't have had to let go of a many of the firefighters and police in which we had to if we weren't swindled out of this money. So blame the city of London, blame the Queen of England, their cohorts, consorts, and what they uh, represent. It is the British Empire. Now, I mentioned earlier, I'm gearing up for another campaign. The world is not getting any better, folks. My credibility is only gaining in momentum because I've been right. 
people want to know and they ask me all the time and I actually sent out a message today to address this people say how do you do it Carrie how did you get famous how do you do what you do how do you fight these people isn't that whatever it's simple I don't compromise they say that's not what you, if you want to be in government Carrie you gotta to learn to compromise don't you see that's what they all do the Republicans and the Democrats they always compromise well, what happens when you compromise? You become compromised. I'm not compromised, because I don't compromise. Now they say, how are you gonna pass legislation if you're not willing to reach across the aisle for a compromise? It's simple, I'm not willing to sell my soul for a little bit of food on the table today. When you see the bigger picture versus that little bite to eat that I kinda want right now, uh, maybe that just don't add up. Maybe I'm not willing to pay that bill. Maybe I can't afford to pay that bill. So what does that mean? Here we are, folks. Like they say, like my mom said, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. So here we are. I'm stepping to the plate. As I've advised Congressman Rick Larson of how to do his own job through emails and even going into his office as of June 22nd of this year, 2012. As this, that, and the other, if these people aren't getting any better, everything is falling apart and getting worse. So here we are again. Carrie Illinumi feels forced to step to the plate. So now I'm not running for city council. I'm not running for mayor of Arlington, Washington. I'm running for what would be United States House of Representatives. That's right. I'm running for Congress, District 2 in Washington State as of spring of 2013. I'm gearing up for my campaign. I'm making it well known right now. And it's obvious that somebody out there is worried and afraid of me, as I'm not going to give you too much attention here, because I know that will only boost, or, boost you, ultimately. Uh, there's a dirty apple out there that tried to make me look bad recently. Fortunately for me, the Arlington Police Station here department knows otherwise and better, uh, as they came out and discussed this with me and explained that they ultimately were on my side regarding this, and they knew that this was bogus, and they were upset regarding this. But this is what people need to see. They need to see some of these conspiracies, these weird little things happen, and some of the games being played against people like me. And this helps people who are kind of on the dumb end of humanity to begin to see, wait a minute here, I don't know about conspiracies. I don't know about Glass-Steagall, National Bank, or this or that or the other. But these guys are doing some real dirty tricks to LaRouche, to Carrie Illinumi, to whoever. And as people begin to see that more and more, even people who are not in the, let's just say, the sharpest tools in the shed, even people like that begin to say, I'm starting to think there's something to it. I'm beginning to start to think this guy may know what he's talking about. Or you see the tax on uh, poor Keisha Rogers that won the primaries uh, for U.S. House of Representatives that was on the show back in May. You see the attacks, the bogus lies, propaganda that spewed about her. They say, she's not a Democrat, or this or that or the other. <laughs> It's, it's all games. It's all jokes. They'll, they'll do anything they can to make someone look bad. They don't have no problem with lying. They have no problem with assassination or assassination of character. They've threatened to kill me already. They've tried to say this and that and the other. They, some animal rights activist organization was utilized to contact the Arlington police station saying that I uh, have this dog that's extremely malnourished. <sighs> well, the problem was <laughs> they made a mistake there because the Arlington Police Department, as they came out to investigate, even though they already knew, they only came out because they had to by law. They didn't come out because they thought there was any legitimacy to it. Well, a dog can't go from skinny and malnourished yesterday to looking buffed and in an extremely beyond ordinary shape by the next day. So... My dog, which eats some of the best quality dog food on the market, I feed it VF along with Canada and other products. These are going anywhere from what would be $50 to $70 a bag for dog food is what I purchase. I like to switch it up here and there too for his diet. So I give my dog stuff, and this is at the co-op, the best place, cheapest place to buy your food. So I give my dog better food than half of the people watching this show probably give their kids. As you know, I drink raw milk, eat farm fresh eggs, and don't like GMO foods. I take pretty good care of myself. Hit the gym three times a week, acupuncture, massages, this, that, and the other. I, I go out of my way uh, to do it right. That ultimately, you know, here we are, trying to make a long story short, not to, to go on a huge bunny tail and a ranting rave here. So, 
I'm tired of how things are being ran. I'm stepping to the plate. I'm running. And as I labeled last Monday before the Arlington City Council, not just I'm running for United States House of Representatives, but this time I win. That's right. I'm throwing myself on another whim here. I haven't been wrong yet, my forecasting record, and I'm saying I'm going to be your next congressman. And it's going to be because people necessarily aren't going to want to support me, but they're going to be forced to because things are getting ready to rock and roll. So just if you think that you can just vote for Romney and everything's going to be okay, this is that same change you can believe in from before. When you follow the money, you realize the same bastards that funded Bush, the big banks of Wall Street, funded Obama, are also funding now Romney, both sides of the campaigns, this and that. When you see this, you begin to realize there's a bigger picture, a bigger scenario. So if you think, if you support the Democrats, for you out there that think, I'm going to be a diehard Republican, and this is somehow going to be the answer, no. We're a divided nation, folks. It's not about Republican, Democrat, like I keep saying. It's not about parties. The party's over. It's time to get sober. <laughs> the smoke and liquor is cleared out of the house, and it's time to clean this joint up now before it gets bad, before the rats and cesspool really comes in. Now, I'm Carrie Illinumi, and I want to read this, what would be email, which I sent today to Congressman Rick Larson. Here's a screenshot of that if you want to zoom in, and I'll be placing this up on the website shortly. To Mr. Larson, please support the funding to NASA's new Curiosity Project and do not support any legislation in which compromises our Second Amendment rights with proposed legislation to have all U.S. citizens be obliged by law to register our guns to the United Nations. If we do, then I can personally assure you that the next step will be a complete gun confiscation of the American people. I know, Rick, that your history shows a very damning record for you regarding your support and capitulation to nearly every bad law of that of George W. Bush and Barack Obama administrations. On the other hand, times are changing rapidly and justice is beginning to be served as the people are on the verge of demanding the incarceration of all U.S. government officials in which have destroyed our economy and way of life. For you to request a meeting for me to come in and advise your office clearly reflects upon the fact that you truly have no grasp over the unfolding peril in which is impending upon our nation. I do believe that after this next term, you will have thoroughly lost the support of your district and you will be discredited and will never again have a chance in hell of ever being an elected member of the United States government. The odds of you being criminally indicted for charges of crimes against humanity increase by the day. Sincerely, former Arlington mayoral candidate Kerry Illinumi from NoSpendNewSource.com. So here I am, folks, fighting for you, the people. I'm going to keep doing that. I know they have re-education camps. They're ready to roll out troops on the streets, ready to have United Nations troops round up our government, treat them like uh, Gaddafi and Assad and this and that, and give us the treatment as the people over there. I'm fighting for the interest of us. I'm going to keep fighting. I'm going to keep doing what I do. Politics are coming in. When you're starving, when you're down and out, when you have or are on the verge of losing your mortgage, trust me, Carrie Illinumi, NoSpendNewSource.com, and politics are going to seem more popular and like a refreshing breath of fresh air in the middle of the Grandview Desert out in Yakima County in the middle of August when it's 107 degrees or down in Barstow, California when you can't hardly breathe. So, I'm Kerry Illinumi. This is your NoSpendNewSource.com production. We're going to have more interviews and action for you later, I can assure you. NoSpendNewSource.com. Take care of yourself and each other, and I'll be seeing you for September 2012. Obama and Mitt Romney and who backs and what they really stand for. It's identical. The rhetoric's a little bit different, but, but I mean, it's getting so close. And then I know all these Republicans are like, we've got to vote for him. Uh, you know, and, and, and these mainline Republicans, they really, a lot of them do believe in freedom, all this stuff. They're just misled. They think Obama's the communist that's going to get them. They don't understand he's financed by big mega banks, and the commie thing is only one level of it. And then I talk to people that are like, well, Obama's a liberal. And then, like you said, 95% of black folks voting for him saying, well, and, and, then, and then none of it got delivered, but it's, it's, it's like Coke, Pepsi, Ford, Chevy. It's not a real choice. It's this, it's this fake 
fake selection that they give us. And what do you say to people out there? Because they're going to say, well, if you're not saying vote for Obama, well, vote for Mitt Romney. No, the point is the whole thing is a fraud. So, I mean, right. what do you say to, uh, you know, black folks in the community you talk to that are like, well, I mean, you were imitating. Oh, I love Obama. I mean, what do you say to them? I say to them to remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, who said, and I quote, we would judge people on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So when black people say, I love Obama because he's black. <laughs> no, I'm going to just say it. You know it's true. He black. What? Excuse me? I didn't know that I was voting or supporting someone based on their pigmentation. I thought I was supposed to support someone, okay, based on what? Their character, what they have done, what their principles are, what their integrity is, okay? That's what I say, not only to black people, but to white people, to brown people, to red people, to yellow people. That's what I say to all people. And, and, and let me just throw this in real quick, Alex. Yes, I call them Martians, and by them I'm talking about the Mitt Romneys and the Barack Obamas. I'm speaking, of course, euphemistically, because we know the media are only But they that. are alien compared to the rest of the people. They're part they of that. They are. Yeah, yeah. They are. You're right. You're absolutely correct. They are alien. And we must begin to understand and look at them for what they are, not for what we want them to be.